Hi there, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 118 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson. For the next half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you with things that matter to me and I think are worthy of your attention. As always, if you have any comments, questions, reactions, whatever about the show, email me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, which you probably didn't, uh, you can always go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and uh, you can get the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there if you'd like. Uh, please, if you do email me, uh, give a little time for response. I'm, I can be a little slow about answering email. Uh, and please be sure to include something in the subject line like, you know, left side of the aisle or something like that so that uh, I know it's not spam. All right, with those, uh, let's get to it. I actually have some good bits, uh, about four different bits of good news, or at least news with good aspects to them. So I figured I'd start with them. First off, you've no doubt heard of the Westboro Baptist Church. This is the outfit in Topeka, Kansas. Um, and by the way, this church is not associated with any Baptist convention at all, by the way. But the Westboro Baptist Church of Topeka, Kansas is a handful of creepy bigots consisting mostly of the family of one Fred Phelps Jr. Now, the cult gained its fame, if you can call it that, by picketing the funerals of soldiers killed in Iraq and Afghanistan and celebrating their deaths, claiming that their deaths are a judgment from God because, as their signs would say, God hates fags. And uh, the U.S. tolerates, they say, homosexuality, which will probably come as a big surprise to a lot of gays in the country, but never mind. They've since branched out uh, using various tragedies as opportunities to spread their bigoted message. Well, when they announced plans to picket the funerals of victims of the Boston Marathon bombings, one group had decided they'd had enough. That group is the Satanic Temple. It's a New York-based organization devoted to, they say, encouraging benevolence and empathy among all people through the teachings of Satan. Uh, they are prepared to counter-protest the WBC, the Westboro Baptist Church, but as it's becoming more common, the bigots just didn't show up. Instead, they later issued a statement saying that they had been there in spirit. So the temple decided that they would meet the WBC in spirit, but on their own terms. They went to Mississippi to the gravesite of Catherine Idolette Johnston, who is Fred Phelps' mother. There on Sunday, July 14th, they performed a ritual called a Pink Mass. It drew on the practice of Mormons of baptizing people into the church after they died. Uh, and um, they did this to, and they did this ceremony, and they declared that, quoting, upon completion of the pink mass ceremony, Catherine Johnston is now gay in the afterlife. What's more, mocking the Westboro Baptist Church's contention that their beliefs are totally infallible and that religious freedom requires that no one can criticize them, the temple declared that, quoting, Fred Phelps is obligated to believe that his mother is now gay, and if beliefs are inviolable rights, nobody has the right to challenge our right to believe that Fred Phelps believes that his mother is now gay. In an email to the Huffington Post, Temple Representative Lucian Greaves said that the group would perform pink masses at the grave sites of Phelps' father, Great Anne, and other descendants of the Phelps family, quoting, each time they picket funerals or applaud horrific uh, terrorist actions. So uh, a little bit of good satire there and good on them for it. Uh, another bit of good news here. A federal judge has temporarily blocked portions of a new North Dakota anti-choice law that had been described as the most restrictive in the nation. He, the provision in question uh, bans abortion at any point after a fetal heartbeat is detected. He called that clearly invalid and unconstitutional and in direct contradiction to a litany of United States Supreme Court cases. Because if fetal heartbeats, in fact, can be detected as early as six weeks after pregnancy, at which point some women don't even know yet that they're pregnant. A separate suit is challenging another measure which requires a doctor who performs abortions to have uh, hospital admitting privileges and which banned one of the two drugs used in non-surgical abortions. 
There's another new state law in North Dakota which would outlaw abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy based on the thoroughly bogus claim that at that point fetuses can feel pain. Sorry folks, the brain is actually one of the last things to develop in pregnancy. No brain, no pain. It's just another lie. Um, it's, an, it's, it's another one right along with like, you know, the abortion causes cancer lie that they tell. It's just another lie. However, the plaintiff in question in the uh, the plaintiff in question in the case where the injunction was just issued is the only remaining uh, clinic in North Carolina that uh, provides abortion services. They're not challenging that provision about 20 weeks because they say they don't do them after 20 weeks, so they'd have no standing to sue because the law doesn't affect them. But oh, lies! Oh yeah, lies. They lie. The right to lifers lie. And it seems to no end how far the fanatics will go in their lies. Here's one. Missouri State Senator, uh, uh, State Senator Whip, uh, I'm sorry, Missouri State Senate Majority Whip. There we go. His name is Brian Neves. He recently said that abortions to save the life of the mother are just a matter of convenience. He asked one of the commenters in a Twitter exchange uh, if that person supports partial birth abortions, which is the inflammatory term that the right-wingers use to describe dilation and extraction. Uh, that's a procedure that is used only rarely in the third semester and then only in cases of complications that threaten the life or health of the mother. Well, when the commenter pointed that out in response, Neve said, Really? Didn't you say you have an advanced degree? Your statement about life of the mother is one of the most common yet kindergarten ways of proving you don't even know what a partial birth abortion is. When the commenter listed some medical conditions that can arise late in pregnancy uh, and cause problems that may require a late-term abortion, Neves replied, life of the mother, your own argument proves it's a matter of convenience. Yes, to them, uh, saving your life or protecting your health is just a matter of convenience. Except, of course, if it involves guns, in which case it's a sacred right. And as a footnote to all this, by the way, let's not forget Texas State Representative Jody Laud uh, Laubenberg, Laubenberg, who in the course of the debate over Texas's recently passed new restrictions on abortion access, declared in, this, in the debate that rape kits, which are intended to gather evidence of a rape, that rape kits are actually a form of abortion. The level of ignorance these people demonstrate is really, really astonishing. All right, well, speaking of a, of a different form of sexism, uh, the, here's a question. If sexist comments about women are made in a workplace, but no woman is around to hear them, can it still be discrimination? According to a landmark decision by the New Jersey Supreme Court, the answer is yes. UPS manager Michael Battaglia was so disturbed by a pattern of lewd remarks about female employees made by his boss in meetings where there was only men present, he repeatedly complained to his superiors. Ultimately, he got a response. He was demoted. His boss, nothing happened to him. He sued for retaliation even as he continued to work in the lower level position. He sued under New Jersey state law that bans workplace discrimination based on things like gender, religion, race, and so on. In 2009, a jury decided in his favor and awarded him a million dollars, 500,000 for economic damages and 500,000 for emotional distress. The company appealed and the appeals court reversed, ruling that Pataglia was not protected for discrimination under the law for complaining about vile comments made against women in the workplace because he wasn't a woman. That is, he couldn't complain about sexism in the workplace because he was male. However, on July 17th, the New Jersey Supreme Court re-reversed, they overruled the appeals court, they sided with Pataglia. They recognized the importance of the point in the law of a hostile work environment. They reaffirmed the $500,000 in economic damages and have sent the emotional distress back to a jury to consider an award. So, yes, you can be offended by sexism even if you're a man.
Uh, finally, on this, uh, one last bit of good news. On July 23rd, New Hampshire Governor Maggie uh, Hassan signed a bill making New Hampshire the 19th state in the United States to recognize medical marijuana. The new law establishes a process to set up alternative treatment centers which will dispense marijuana for qualified persons with, quote, chronic or terminal diseases, or, quoting again, debilitating medical conditions. Now, even though it could take several years for this program to be set up and fully implemented, this is still regarded as a clear step forward. Uh, one, one, uh, one group, the Marijuana Policy Project, did note some shortcomings in the law. It doesn't allow people to grow their own marijuana in their own house, uh, and it contains language that could potentially create legal problems for some people who resort to cannabis uh, for their conditions before this program is fully implemented. But still, it's a real step forward. And by the way, among the 19 states and the District of Columbia where medical marijuana is recognized, it includes all six uh, states of New England. Good on us. All right, moving on to one of our regular weekly features, the Clown Award. This week, the big, it's given, I should say, as always, for uh, acts of meritorious stupidity. And this week, the winner of the Big Red Nose is Representative, U.S. Representative Steve King of Iowa. Now, first, to understand this, you need to be reminded of the DREAM Act. This was a bill that was intended to provide a path to citizenship for undocumented young people living in the U.S. These would be people who had been brought here to the U.S. by undocumented immigrants when they were children, brought by parents or, or guardians. These are kids who have grown up in the U.S., who have gone to and go to schools in the U.S., who identify as Americans, but who are not citizens, and who cannot become citizens unless they first leave the country and then apply to immigrate to the only country they've ever known. The DREAM Act has failed to pass. So the Obama administration, and good on them for this, established a policy of refusing to deport people who would be covered by the DREAM Act unless they had been convicted of a crime. Uh, these people now are commonly called DREAMers, by the way, people who would be covered by the Act. Well, last month, Steve King successfully pushed an amendment that would require an end to that policy of uh, not deporting people. He has already announced his opposition to a yet-to-be-released bill from two other Republicans that would legalize DREAMers and um, allow them to stay in the United States. And he followed that up by going on a Spanish-language outlet for an interview where of course, his opposition to immigration law was brought up. The host asked him what he, Steve King, would do with, since he's opposed to immigration reform, what would he have us do with the estimated 11 million undocumented workers in the United States? King's answer was, quoting, it's not my responsibility. Pressed on it, he just repeated myself, it's not my responsibility to solve that problem. What he was arguing is that is these people, they brought it on themselves. They brought it on themselves by coming here. And remember that the people covered by the DREAM Act were brought here as children by their parents or guardians. But who cares about that? Not Steve King. No siree. He, you know, it's, it's all up to whatever happens to them, whatever, whatever exploitation, whatever cruelty, whatever discrimination they experience, whatever it's visited on him, well, he just doesn't give a damn. It's their own fault. It's all he says about the rule of law. And if we have sympathy for the dreamers, then we will have destroyed the rule of law. Of course, if the Dream Act passed, that would be the rule of law. But people like King are incapable of following a rational line of thought that far. And by the way, in that same interview, that same interview, despite all his talk about the rule of law, King avoided saying that he would actually want to deport millions of people. So as long as he can talk about the rule of law as some abstract principle, he's happy. But when it comes to the actual effect of actually enforcing that law, well, apparently that's another problem for which he has no responsibility. He topped all of this off with an interview in the right-wing fake news site uh, Newsmax on July 18th, where he declare, declared that, quoting, 
For everyone, this was everyone who would be covered by the DREAM Act. I'm quoting him. For everyone who's a valedictorian, there's another 100 out there that weigh 130 pounds and they've got calves the size of cantaloupes because they're holding 75 pounds of marijuana across the desert. In other words, according to him, for every valedictorian, there are 100 drug smugglers. Stephen King doesn't care about the rule of law. He doesn't even care. I mean, he doesn't even care. He cares even less, in fact, about what the rule of law is supposed to be for, which is support the rule of justice. Stephen King just cares about being a bigoted xenophobe. And bigoted xenophobes are, by definition, clowns. By the way, there's a footnote to this before we go to break. A few goppers are willing to go on Spanish language radio, but not, they claim, for lack of trying. According to a congressional aide, quoting, we are constantly looking to engage Hispanic media outlets on a variety of issues and will continue to do so. But then went on to call it an unfortunate setback that one host has criticized goppers on air. To put this more directly, we'd be glad to talk to them, but they might be mean to us. <laughs> Jeez, these people are such a bunch of whining crybabies. And we're taking a break. And here we are back again. And we're going to come right back with our other regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. Uh, McDonald's is notorious for its underpaid, overworked employees, but um, it's decided to show how much it in fact actually deeply cares for their welfare. So it has partnered with Visa, the, the credit card people, yes Visa, to launch a website to teach its low-income workers um, how to budget so that they can get by on their meager wages which average $8.25 an hour. That, by the way, if you don't have a calculator in your head or at, uh, in your hand, works out to $17,160 a year. That is pre-tax, and that's even assuming full-time, year-round work with paid vacation and sick time. Well, the site includes a sample, uh, a sample budget journal uh, for McDonald's employees that starts, look at this now, it starts by assuming that full-time, year-round job at McDonald's, which would give a net income, um, an after-tax net income, of just about what the show is, a little over $1,100 a month. It then lists a second job. Now, remember, this budget is for people already working a 40-hour week. For this second job, if you assume the same rate of pay, that's another 34 hours a week you have to work. You have to be working a 74-hour week. Uh, then, look at some of the other figures at list. $600 a month for rent? That'll get you a broom closet in most cities. $20 a month for health care? Sure, if the only health care you need is, a, is some Band-Aids and a bottle of Pepto-Bismol. Now, if you want health insurance, an average cost of a plan for an individual is $215 a month. And in fact, even McDonald's company subsidized group health plan costs the employees $14 a week, which is roughly triple what this allows per month. He, it's nothing, nothing for heating, zero dollars for heating. And this, you notice this budget does not even include food or clothing. Now, I mean, this, this is, but I do have to add, I do have to add a response to the bad attention this is now getting. McDonald's did change one part of that budget. It now allows $50 a month for heat. I just wonder where it is they think their employees are coming from. What do they daily commute from Florida or something? I mean, and by the way, the budget allows for that expense by taking money away from other. Now, interestingly, at the site, McDonald's and Visa tell us you can have almost anything you want as long as you plan ahead and save for it. Because, as we all know, the only reason low-wage workers struggle is because they're too lazy to plan or too stupid to do a budget and they lack the self-restraint uh, self in order to save. That's the only reason. And if you only tell them how to do it, everything will be fine. What? an incredible outrage. 
By the way, there are two footnotes to this. One, this budget journal. This budget journal gives tips on ways to save money. Now, one of the ways, they say, is not to use an out-of-system ATM to avoid uh, service charges. But the list does not include avoiding using a credit card to avoid the interest charges. And, but it does suggest having your pay automatically deposited to a payroll card, something that outfits like Visa make a profit on. The other footnote, by the way, last year Bloomberg News found that it would take the average McDonald's employee one million hours of work to earn as much money as the company's CEO. All right. From there, we go to uh, a very occasional, once in a while feature. It's called the little thing. It's because a lot of times, or frequently enough, I find in some article, some news, some issue or something, there is a little thing that people don't seem to be noticing, don't seem to be commenting on this part of the thing. And I think it's somehow revealing or deserves attention. So here's the little thing. It starts with the fact the University of Southern California is facing a federal investigation for alleged failures by school officials and campus police to prosecute rape. Now, Title IX, as you may know, is the part of civil rights laws that applies to sex discrimination in educational institutions. In response to a Title IX complaint filed in May, the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, or the OCR, has launched an inquiry. The claimants are a group of 13 students, plus some other unnamed students, who claim that they suffered from extensive failures on the part of USC administrators and its Department of Public Safety, the campus police, in responding to reports of sexual violence on campus. Now, such failures would be violations of Title IX. Complaints included a charge that the USC dismissed one student's claim that her ex-boyfriend had raped her, even though she had him on tape admitting doing it. An official in that case told the woman that the goal here was to educate the attacker, not to punish him. Another student said the campus police told her she hadn't been raped because her attacker had not had an orgasm. A third, who complained of a sexual assault at a fraternity event, got told that women should not go out, get drunk, and expect not to get raped. And the assailants who did get punished in some of these cases frequently just got a slap on the wrist. In fact, some of them were just told, well, just stay away from her. I mean, this is a serious issue, obviously. Violence on the campuses is a serious issue. Serious enough that the OCR is currently engaged in similar investigations of four other colleges. But here's the little thing, the thing that people haven't commented on. Jody Shipper. This is the Title IX Coordinator for USC and Executive Director of the University's Office of Equity and Diversity. Said the university, quoting, remains vigilant in addressing any issues promptly and fully as they arise, and said that the university has been reviewing its policies to ensure they comply with federal law, adding, quote, we look forward to working with OCR to address any concerns. <laughs> Excuse me? Title IX was passed in 1972, and now, 41 years later, you are getting around to addressing concerns and reviewing your policies, and you wonder why there's a problem? Apparently, the higher learning parts of university do not extend to the higher levels of administration. All right, from there, we're actually going to spend a couple of minutes talking about something to do with guns. We're going to start with a quote from a post at Alternet. Quote, imagine a counter demonstration to a Boston Marathon vigil. Imagine a counter demonstration to an Oklahoma tornado or Hurricane Sandy vigil. Ridiculing and mocking someone else's loss is so heinous and emotionally abusive, legislation was passed last year to keep protests 300 feet away from military funerals. That legislation, of course, was inspired by the antics of the Westboro Baptist Church, but nothing is too low for the gun nuts.
On Friday, July 20th, Aurora, Colorado held a commemoration of the Aurora Theater Massacre, which occurred exactly one year earlier, when James Holmes, dressed for combat and carrying smoke grenades, a 12-gauge shotgun, an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle with a 100-round uh, magazine, and a 22 pistol, entered the Century 16 multiplex and began shooting. When it was over, 12 people were dead, 58 more shot. Now, in addition to the commemoration held by the city, the group Mayors Against Illegal Guns held a commemoration in a city park, which began with families of shooting victims from Aurora, Columbine, and Newtown before several speakers began reciting the names of the people killed by gun violence. Not only are those killed and wounded in Aurora, but the hundreds, the thousands, who have been killed by gun violence across the country. The reading went on for 11 hours until the last speaker, Stephen Barton, one of the wounded in Aurora, ended at 12.38 a.m., the time the first shots rang out one year earlier. So it was a peaceful, emotional vigil to remind people of the human cost of gun violence, which of course could not be tolerated by the gun nuts. So the Rocky Mountain Gun Owners Group announced it was going to counter-protest when it called New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg's, quote, radical East Coast anti-gun agenda and how this is not supported by Coloradans. And that statement, that statement was actually made on the group's behalf by a spokeswoman for the National Association for Gun Rights, which is headquartered in the East Coast state of Virginia, nowhere near Colorado. In other words, this group was going to counter-protest a memorial to the dead. Because all those dead had nothing to do with guns, of course not, nothing at all. And if James Holmes had been armed with popcorn balls and darts, he would have been just as dangerous. Nothing is too low for these people and their addiction to their guns. On the upside, pictures taken by a supporter of the gun nuts show that their turnout was maybe around 10. Uh, maybe they aren't as representative of all the people of Colorado as they like to think. One quick thing before we close. Um, this picture, you've probably seen this. This is the cover of Rolling Stone with Zokar Tsarnaev on the cover, and people have been upset by this. I want to suggest to you, and think about this, that the reason people are upset by this cover is because it, he looks like a good-looking kid, which he is. But he doesn't look evil. He doesn't look foreign. He doesn't look other. He doesn't look not us. And we can't deal with the fact that somebody who could be a good-looking kid who doesn't look foreign or evil could actually have done what he did. You think about that, and you think about your reactions to that. Anyway, I, I'm out of time, so I'm going to finish up with our weekly reminder. As of July 24th, there have been about, been, excuse me, at least 6,490 people killed by gunfire in the United States since Newtown, at least 68 of those in Massachusetts. You have the best week you can. We'll see you next week.